Mr. Robin A. Pearl, founder and president of American Pinade Incorporated, Florida, USA. Mr. Pearl first became active in the shrimp industry in the early 2000s by building the first and largest bioflock inland and low salinity shrimp farm in Florida, USA. In 2013, he co-founded American Mariculture Incorporated to supply fresh grown all natural shrimp to the US market. I want to thank um, ICAR and SEBA for inviting me to make this presentation. Um, my presentation is not going to be very scientific. I think we got a lot of that this morning. And I just want to give you a, a background of um, a real farm story um, that uh, could have had a really bad ending, but it looks like it's having a good ending. So my title is How Genetics Saved Our Farm. We started a shrimp farm in Florida, USA in 2013. And I had a team assembled of uh, people with a lot of experience and knew what they're doing. Uh, we were doing a bioflock farm, it's gonna be SPF. And we really built a state-of-the-art facility to, uh, to do that. And um, uh, had a business plan, had a good marketing plan, had uh, lots of demand for our shrimp. And after we started, we actually had a really decent harvest. We had 75, 80% survival, which is what we were looking for. But very quickly thereafter, our survival started going down and um, ultimately ended to be about 15 to 20% survival. And uh, we did all kinds of testing to see what it, uh, what it was. We thought maybe it's disease, but it wasn't. And um, it took us a long time to figure it out. Um, but uh, unfortunately, um, it's expensive to do business in the United States. And when you have a, a large capital project, you better perform quickly. So we almost went out of business. And um, we had to find a solution in a hurry. So when you're a new farm and you feel that you know what you're doing, and all of a sudden your shrimp start dying, and you have no track record, you, you, you start looking at everything. And this is when we started with um, getting a lot of consultants to come to our farm, and every consultant would have a solution for us, and they happened to sell that solution. So we tried all kinds of probiotics, we tried all kinds of different feeds, we tried essential oils, um, we had all kinds of water testing done, et cetera, and so on, and nothing really solved it and, and add to that the difficulty is whenever you, you do something different, it takes some time to figure out whether that stuff actually works. So long story short, nothing really worked until we changed genetics, until we changed, until we got a new animal onto our farm. <clears throat> and so we found animals uh, in the United States where we, we can only use SPF animals and there was a very large SPS, SPF hatchery uh, located nearby our farm in the Florida Keys, which is what we used. And um, anyway, we, we, we had to go find stock somewhere else, and which we did. So um, and, uh, one of the consultants we had suggested we use ape animals from Ecuador that had been cleaned up and made SPF. And these ape animals are all pathogen exposed. Um, that were basically, yesterday there were a couple of presentations and they said that um, it's one, you know, one of three viable stocks where in Ecuador, they've, ever since they had white spot, their production has been increasing year after year. And they have all kinds of diseases and all kinds of issues there, but yet their shrimp seem to be surviving. So we took a chance on those animals and um, they worked. We had them side by side with our normal stocks and it was amazing to see how much better those animals were surviving. They were surviving at 70, 80%, whereas the other ones were at 15, 20%. And you can see a tank that had the new genetics as opposed to a tank with the old genetics. There'll be floating dead shrimp in the old one, and uh, the new one are just, um, the, the, there were just full, full, copious amounts of shrimp jumping out. We had to put extra nets around our tanks and stuff like that. So, um, so we became a real believer in these genetics. Now, they had some drawbacks because they, they do have good survival, but they didn't grow fast. And not only that, they seem to level off their growth when they reach 15, 16 grams. They really wouldn't grow anymore. So that was a problem, but at least we had something to go with. So you hear a lot about the Ecuador animals, et cetera, and so on, why they're successful. And again, um, they, the original ape animals, they came from the ponds that were the survivors of, of, of whatever was left over after they got hit by diseases. 
And you know, people say, well, that, that's the reason why it's successful, but they forget about the second part, which is at the same time they were doing a DNA uh, analysis in, in, in Ecuador where they actually looked at the shrimp and did DNA sampling on them to make sure they did not inbreed. But if you go to a pond and you get, you know, let's say the pond is wiped out and you have, you know, 100% mortality, you're always going to find a couple survivors in that pond. Let's say you use those. If you're just then going to use those over and over and over again, you're going to inbreed very rapidly. And at that point, you're gonna, your stock's going to crash as well. So it's a combination of both choosing those animals that have that resistance to whatever those uh, environment throws at them and doing a DNA-based program where you're selecting animals that are not uh, closely related to do the breeding forward. So in 2016, we, we uh, decided that this is our future, this is what we have to do, and um, we decided to develop our own genetic uh, improvement program. We got the stocks at our farm, and we uh, implemented a, a very intensive uh, DNA-based uh, selection program. When we do DNA analysis, one of the advantages it does, besides figuring out to make sure we're not inbreeding, we can actually do a uh, analysis of survival within our tanks under commercial grow-out conditions. If you normally do a, um, um, you, you, you spawn animals and you, and you take that cross or you take that family and then you put it in the cage and you'll see what the survival is, you have this thing called the cage effect. What we're able to do is we're able to take all our crosses and put them together and then grow them out in a tank or in a pond and then at the end of the cycle, do a DNA analysis on a sample of those animals and find out which crosses had higher survival on a, on a relative basis. And then from there, we've decided, say, okay, number one criteria is to find those families that perform, uh, that have higher survival rates. And then within those families, we try to find the ones that have higher growth rates. Um, and by our geneticist is actually able to um, do this thing called outbreeding where we take distantly, uh, as, as, far remo as far as distant as possible, the families and, and try to outbreed that way rather than inbreed. So the, 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 main, the main issue with the shrimp initially was that they wouldn't grow uh, very fast and that they stopped growing after 15, 16 grams. Um, but once we did a, several selections with our shrimp, and, and you know, it goes very quickly, we were able to get um, much, more, much better results very quickly. And, um, at this point, our farm is, is basically 100% of production, uh, creating food shrimp. At the same time, we're getting a tremendous amount of demand from other people across the world that want to have uh, access to our genetics. <clears throat> so, you know, it's, it, it's funny. So we had this big problem trying to, trying to actually stay in business. And so we were able to, you know, get this new, new genetic line going. And then all of a sudden, everybody else around the world starts knocking on the door saying, hey, we want to have some of these shrimp. It was never our intention to become a genetic broodstock company. That was never the plan. We wanted to go grow shrimp for the American market. So this year, um, this is our, our third year, year shipping into Asia and primarily China and, and some, some to Vietnam, but primarily China. And it's, it's, it's been absolutely crazy the amount of orders that we're getting from there. And they're based on the success of last year's animals and they're, they're all doing well. And um, um, yeah, we hope that that continues. Um, I'm here because I want to, uh, uh, I believe that our animals would also be good for the Indian market because uh, to have an animal that's hardy, that's able to take the stresses that are out there in the environment and give you a better chance to, um, uh, to grow shrimp is something that's going to be important. Deep down inside, I'm a farmer. All I want is a good shrimp that's going to give me a good crop. That's all I want. <clears throat> we have a, um, the initial farm that we built was, um, uh, basically uh, made to produce 500 tons of, uh, of food shrimp grade every year. And uh, we've now converted that to basically all hatcheries or, or multiplication. And so we're able to produce a, a tremendous amount of rootstock on an annual basis. Um, and uh, again, this was never the plan, but this is how it has evolved. And um, uh, it, very, very fortunate to be in this position. Um, also fortunate to be in Florida where we have very good connections to be able to ship the broodstock into India. Um, there's, um, I guess, 29 flights that are, you know, between tw 21 and 26 hours and add an extra 10, 15 hours of transit time to the, to the airport and then from, uh, from uh, Chennai to 
the quarantine center and, and we have very good connections to, uh, to get the shrimp here. <clears throat> I was able to attract top talent and uh, one of the persons is Margaret Barlow uh, who has an uh, extensive amount of experience shipping broodstock and uh, she came on board about a year and a year and a half ago now and uh, she overtakes the team and I know a lot of the, the hatcheries here in India have uh, familiarity working with her so very excited to have her on our team and and um, you know we've based on the demand we've really built a whole new broodstock shipping center and uh, the different capabilities in order to do that. So one of the one of the lessons I want to give you guys is that no matter how bad things get never give up. I'm standing in front of you you know, five years ago, if you would have said, look, you're going to go stand in Chennai and make a presentation about your shrimp, uh, you know, I would have never expected that. My goal was to grow shrimp for the American market. I had really no reason to be in, in India. But because the stocks didn't work and we had to go find a solution, and it was a fight for our survival, um, something, a new door opened. And, and this door has been a great door for us. And, and so one thing I want to impart to everybody here is, is look, Never give up. I mean, no matter how bad it gets, there's always a solution out there. And all the presentations you heard today, there's a lot of smart people that are trying to figure things out and um, a lot of smart solutions out there. So, um, you know, it's, it's, it's uh, no matter how dark, things is, how dark things are, it gets better. It can get better. So don't give up. And that's all I have to say. And I want to thank you very much for your time.